Hello and welcome to another episode of the Omics Casts. And today we're going to talk about uh, CRISPR rabies and um, CCR5. Um, I'm going to do an analysis of a CCR5 by one paper and the Twitter reaction to it and how this relates to the story of the CRISPR babies that was announced uh, took place in China at the end of last year. And so the paper that I'm going to look at is the uh, uh, the, re the review of a paper published by uh, Shinzo Wei and Rasmus Nielsen in Nature Medicine that looks at the, CCR, uh, the CCR5 Delta 32 uh, deletion and how it relates to the fitness of the individuals um, that carry it. And the uh, Twitter reaction, especially from uh, Sean Harrison, uh, that does a reanalysis in the paper and comments on it. And so why is this related to um, the CRISPR wave as well. The paper um, was picked up by the press and uh, they quoted things like, people with two disabled copies of the CCR5 gene are 21% more likely to die before the age of 76 when compared to people with at least one working copy of the gene. Um, the uh, story uh, relates to the CRISPR babies in the sense that the CRISPR babies that were uh, born uh, at the end of last year um, were um, gene edited so that they would be HIV resistant. Uh, this is another one that uh, was picked up at the Atlantic, the mutation meant to help the CRISPR babies, now it's going to make them uh, die uh, younger and it's due to uh, the predisposition of people with the mutation to um, infections like flu or the West Nile virus. So the paper itself about CCR5 was published by Rasmus Nielsen, this last author, UC Berkeley, University of Copenhagen, uh, an expert in population genetics, evolution genetics, evolution statistical genetics, uh, who has published for several uh, years or even uh, more uh, decades already. And the first author is Shinju Wei, a PhD student at the University of Michigan. You can see the profile here on uh, LinkedIn. And uh, one of the uh, commenters on Twitter for this paper is Sean Harrison, who is at the University of Bristol, where the UK Biobank has um, been studied uh, heavily. And he's an expert in um, uh, analyzing data from the UK Biobank. And so he says, I have some issues with this paper and then I need, my, I need the same analysis my way last night. Uh, so the paper, conclusions of paper is uh, Rasmus Nielsen and Shinzo Wei analyzing uh, more than 400,000 individuals of British ancestry from the UK Biobank uh, to investigate the fitness effects, the uh, effects that have a phenotypic uh, fitness um, effect on, uh, from the genotype here, the Delta 32 mutation of CCR5. And they said that for uh, um, homozygous recessive individuals, uh, there's a 21% increase in the all-cause mortality rate in individuals who are homozygous for the uh, deletion. They say the deleterious effect of this mutation can be also independently supported by a significant deviation of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, or HWE, uh, due to the efficiency of these individuals at the time of recruit recruitment that they uh, can calculate based on the recruitment in uh, the UK Biobank cohort. So what's the high hardy in uh, principle or equilibrium without too much, going too, too many details? It basically says that uh, um, the frequencies of alleles will remain constant generation to generation in a population unless there is an evolutionary influence or otherwise uh, changing those frequencies, right? And one way in which they can change is by a selection, right? So directional selection can eventually lead to the loss of an allele if that allele has an effect on the fitness of the individuals, right? And so if you have a recessive mutation and the homozygous recessive um, have a lower fitness, then this frequency here in the um, equation will uh, go down, meaning um, it will end up disappearing and it will not uh, generation to generation um, remain the same in this formula. So Sean Harrison goes and comments on the paper and uh, he looks at the uh, possible technical difficulties that he encounters in uh, analyzing the, the paper. Uh, he says that they don't account for relatedness, which could be why they have such trouble with the Hardy-Weimer uh, equilibrium. 
and it likely biases the analysis. Uh, the, he says that secondly, they don't do quality control on the UK Biobank, which is something is a resource available at the University of Bristol, and he puts a link to a uh, URL for the data sets. Thirdly, he says we don't use British ancestry in genetic analysis because it's too diverse and the population certification is a big problem. How did they use principal components analysis to confirm where uh, um, people uh, were from British ancestry anyway? That's not reported. He says the problems he sees in the analysis, uh, he doesn't comment on the choice of SNP. Uh, let's assume it's appropriate. The survival curve should have confidence intervals. And if it doesn't, then you cannot really evaluate how much of it is, is going on here, right? And then he says in adjusting, um, he adjusted for its sex central or principal components. Uh, if you don't adjust for that, uh, only adjusting for statistically significant confounders uh, when you have hundreds of thousands of participants, um, there's no benefit in that uh, restricted adjustment unless you're worried that some confounders mediators. Uh, that uh, isn't possible here. So he says, let's adjust for everything. Uh, he says that the p-values come from a long uh, log rank test, and he wonders why not use Cox regression. And then there's a lot, a lot of um, inbreeding in, in his part, but didn't uh, take out related individuals. So he's going to do that by taking out related individuals, right? So he really does the analysis, uh, uh, restricting to a appropriate set of participants, white, British, and related, and QC. And then he has to discard about 70,000, 80,000 people in his uh, QC data set. Um, he took those participants, grabbed their allele count for the SNP, sex, age, principal component, center, and dates of resistance and death and then uh, did the analysis and put everything into a Cox regression in strat, in strat, as he says here. He says his mind only the frequency that he finds is about 11 and 12 percent. And so the results that he comes up with is that uh, the Cox regression shows a hazard, radio, hazard, uh, hazard ratio of 1.075 for having the homozygous uh, mutant allele. And the 90% confidence interval is quite big, as you can see here. And the P for the P value is uh, above 0 0.05, 0 0.38. So on average, slightly higher than not having the uh, homozygous mutant allele, but the confidence interval is wide, right? Much wider than reported in the study. So some numbers, uh, he says it's truncated because he only uses uh, some of these. Um, he says he made the SNP that they were looking binary. Um, and so, uh, and equally found nothing or not, right? And so, why the small effect size and why uh, confidence intervals? He says there are several reasons that come to mind. The first is that there is no confidence intervals um, uh, in the reported study. The second is uh, he has no idea what the method was used to calculate the effect estimate but then goes and, and look at the things that he can kind of control. The third is the sample was likely biased by the participation of the participation selection, um, possibly through including not white, non-white participants, not using the participants and or including related participants. Obviously, if you use UK by one and use all the participants, the ones that are non-white um, uh, come from a different population and you, have, you may have stratification problems with that. He says the fourth is that the analysis didn't include enough confounders, especially center, because if this is being recruited in different centers, then he says that has to be used as part of the uh, correction. And then he does a survival curve with confidence intervals, but it isn't adjusted for confounders. That won't let me do confidence intervals with adjustment for confounders. And he plots the survival uh, curve here, kaplan mayer survival estimates for, for this uh, SNP. And he says, it seems clear to me that deaths are rare, being homozygous for the mutant allele is rare, and the confidence around survival of people with homozygous of this SNP is slow, is slow because of A and B. I would also like to note that no paper in 2019 should publish without confidence interval on porn estimates, and there's a bit of a rant on uh, how this uh, ended up happening. Uh, 
uh, age groups, uh, said the minimum age of UK by rank recruitment is 37, uh, 39 in white, which is not related. And the max is 73. So how did they uh, get the range 81, uh, 41 to 78? And that can't come from the same time point. In any case, uh, should the age even be uh, the X basis? I used uh, follow-up years and adjusted for age, which makes no sense to me. The methods are very difficult to follow. It took me ages to uh, look for this and that, etc. And wonders what did they adjust uh, for the population? What was the proportion number of people that were homozygous for the mutant allele? Uh, he says he's not a big fan of the paper, but I think a chunk of what of that is that I don't believe the Nature Medicine properly reviewed the paper. Uh, makes the code available for what he did in uh, Stata, and so people can go and have a look. Um, someone chipped in uh, William uh, Gibson and said, uh, it's really hard to find SNPs that correlate with longevity in UK Biobank. And the, he says, indeed, this paper, they actually look at this question, uh, points at the paper and says, there's 20, 25 genetic losses associated to human longevity. And he says that CCR5 doesn't show up here, right? So this is a way of saying, even if CCR5 has a, as decreased fitness, uh, in this paper, they didn't see it as a, link, a decreased fitness for human longevity. Uh, so Rasmus Nielsen uh, does a very good job at, re at replying to this, I think, and we'll go through it. Uh, we are analyzing different markers. The marker you're analyzing is in LD with Delta 32, but the probe for the marker we're analyzing is directly targeting Delta 32. The SNP is described in the section entitled uh, so-and-so. He says that they use uh, the other SNP as an additional validation, but all the analysis in the paper are based on the uh, SNP that targets the, the mutation, which should be the correct marker to use. And then uh, on the filtering schemes, he says they are different and that he redid the analysis making your filtering scheme while maintaining as many unrelated delta deltas and the results are below. He uses more covariates than us, including center. We have redone, he uses more covariates than can center. Rasmus does say we have redone the analysis using the additional covariates suggested. And says he expresses mortality, uh, Rasmus Nielsen in the paper, they express mortality as a function of age rather than time since enrollment. And they argue that this is a more appropriate analysis as mortality is not linear, a linear function of age, right? And so, uh, inspecting the scripts of the reanalysis, it looks like you're only considering individuals who die rather than individuals who survive. Ignoring overall survivorship leads to a marked reduction in statistical power. Uh, when redoing the analysis, removing up to a uh, third degree kin, uh, that is all pairs in so and so, and flip on with more than 10 kin, uh, and controlling for sex, uh, principal components, etc., they still get a significant p-value similar to that of the reported in the paper, right? And then he says, points two to four does not seem to make much difference in the calculation of p-values in this case. The main difference is in points one and five, um, how you consider um, individuals who die or survive. And um, if they redo the analysis, ignoring uh, leaving people and using the wrong market instead, uh, then they get a non-significant p-value as uh, the reanalysis. Then says, I'll send you an email, hope to continue conversation, etc. Uh, offers to clarify any other questions about the analysis to anyone. And then uh, Sean Har Harrison comes back, says, happy to talk by email, etc., etc. And then uh, comments on why he chose the SNP he chose um, in the first place in the reanalysis. and that there was a confusion about the SNP that they use on one side and the other. So how does this relate to the CRISPR babies in China? Up until this point, we've looked at the paper, we've looked at the merits of this paper, as in, uh, is the Delta 32 uh, homozygous uh, genotype um, affecting the fitness of the individuals? Um, how does this relate to the CRISPR babies, the, what happened? happen in China. Well, HIV is a particle that has to expose uh, certain um, uh, proteins to the cell surface of the target cell that is trying to infect. And so it first connects to CD4 and then 
there's some co-receptors binding. And then CCR5, the paper that we're, the, the gene that we're talking in this paper, is the last one that makes this connection. And then the HIV particle fuses with the target cell and uh, the infection uh, takes, takes place. Now, being uh, uh, deleterious for this uh, gene or having it uh, uh, having a delta 32 of the gene, which means that this uh, interaction cannot happen, it means that um, in principle it should make you resist to, resist, uh, uh, resistant to HIV. But who's got these mutations? Who's got delta 32? Well, if you look at the map of Europe and uh, part of East Asia here, um, this uh, mutation happens spontaneously and there's a, a gradation in different uh, countries as shown here in the plot. So this is something that happens naturally, right? How does this relate to the CRISPR babies in China? Well, what, what they did uh, late uh, last year is take an HIV carrier and HIV negative uh, who wanted to have babies, uh, do in vitro fertilization, and then use the CRISPR-Cas technology to do gene editing of the blastocysts of the, uh, that came from in vitro fertilization. They implanted them on the mother and then uh, two twins uh, uh, were born, Lulu and Nana, and then they analyzed from these twins uh, what their physiological state was and HIV um, status, and they claim that the, the healthy the babies are healthy and that, that g this gene editing has worked, right? So this has been controversial, obviously, this gene editing um, done in China, and there has been a reaction to it. Rasmus Nielsen says, I feel obliged to have to comment on the many news stories arguing that the CRISPR babies will die young, right? Because of the interpretation of the paper that we discussed. He says, this interpretation is not valid and are all responsible. He says, first, the effect size we estimate is not nearly as strong enough to warrant such a conclusion. Also, the confidence intervals are very large, and we've pointed out the reasons of why that's the case. I've had a hard time getting the later po latter point out in the press stories. You cannot transfer the effects we see in the UK by one to people in China where these babies were born because of differences in environment and genetic background. And he says, thirdly, as far as we know, one of the individuals, uh, Lulu and Nana, is heterozygous, and none of them have the exact delta 32 mutation, which relates to um, the measurements in the paper. But instead, all the mutations aimed at mimicking the effect of delta 32. So here's the here's the paper. Here's the conclusion of what it is, and um, I, I think it's an interesting uh, point here. We've seen an, an example of people. Uh, having conversations through social media on uh, scientific matters, going down to the details. I think it's quite a constructive conversation that took place here. And how I, I highlighted how this relates to the CRISPR babies. And I, and I want to pose the question to you, and here's the URL to the, to the poll, bit.ly uh, slash CRISPR babies. How do you feel about the possibility of applying gene editing to correct or to cure genetic diseases? And there's four choices plus an other for you to comment. Uh, first choice, overwhelmingly positive of human gene, uh, gene editing, or relatively positive but, uh, positive, but only when the risks are properly assessed. Relatively neg negative, but it may have a future, may maybe something that is valuable to humanity in the future, or overwhelmingly negative about the idea now and in the future. And remember, in the other, you can also comment. Thank you for uh, watching this video cast. If you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle is twitter.com forward slash Obervilleja. I'm happy for you also to contact me via LinkedIn and uh, I'll be uh, happy to answer any questions you may have. And a reminder that this slide deck is available upon request. Until next time, goodbye.